The recording has started. Okay. Hi, um, welcome to the Master Gardener Plant Clinic. Uh, we are Master Gardeners for San Mateo, San Francisco counties. And we are delighted to, to be here today to answer your questions about your garden and other plant related questions. Um, note that all uh, attendees are muted and that um, if you have a question, please submit it through the chat box. We have some questions that were um, submitted in advance and we will be addressing those first. And then we will be addressing the uh, questions in the chat box. This clinic is being recorded and will be posted and the PDF files will be sent to the attendees. Next file. Uh, next, yes. <laughs> um, the Master Gardeners in, affi in um, affiliation with San Mateo Arboretum Society is where we usually are. Uh, Master Gardens sit once a month at the Arboretum and we um, answer questions. Um, we hope to be back there soon. Um, we miss it and we hope you'll stop by once we are. Thank you, next. Today, um, our Master Gardener um, panelists uh, Cindy Burkoff, Carolyn Dorsch, Jonathan Propp, Betsy Sheldon, and myself, Cindy Morris, are all very, very qualified to answer your questions. And let's start with Cindy. Cindy, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm a master gardener since uh, 2008. Um, I lecture about uh, vegetable gardens, wildlife habitats, particularly bees, butters, butterflies and hummingbirds. Um, I have a big garden and I have um, chickens, I have a worm bin and I have six compost bins. Cindy, so, uh, where do you live? Pardon me? What city do you live in? Oh, I live in Atherton. So I live in the warm part of the county. <laughs> yes, you do. Okay, next. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name is Carolyn Dorsch, and I graduated last year um, from the Master Gardener program in January. And I've been a lifelong gardener. I'm retired, and um, so I've been wanting to be a Master Gardener for a long, long time. I live in Menlo Park, and uh, I have a lot of shade, pretty shady garden, but I enjoy growing California native plants and propagating them. I volunteer at the San Carlos Habitat Garden and I like to try to grow vegetables year round. Next. I'm Jonathan Propp, I'm a class of 2008 Master Gardener, also Menlo Park, but closer to the Bay, so a cooler climate than Cindy. Um, also smaller yard than Cindy, but uh, grow organic fruits and vegetables and herbs. Next. And I'm Betsy Shelton, and I'm in the class of 2008. Uh, that's when I joined the Master Gardeners. I live in Half Moon Bay, so I'm on the coastal, foggy, cool part of the county. Um, and my favorite plants that I love to talk about are camellias and wisteria. And next, and that's me. Um, I graduated the class of 2010. I enjoy uh, herbs, houseplants, orchids, propagation. Oh, I like everything. Um, and I like speaking. So let's get started with the first question. Uh, question number one is, I have a camellia which is affected by browning blossoms and leaves. Petal blight, question mark, more than its neighbors. The upper part of the plant that receives the most sun seems especially affected. I'd like to direct this to Betsy Sheldon since she is a camellia person. Go ahead, yes. Betsy. Yes, I love talking about camellias. Um, so interestingly, uh, wind, sun, and rain also will cause petals on camellias to turn brown. And the clues to me in this picture and this question that this is not camellia petal blight are that the problem is worse where the plant is most exposed to wind, sun, and rain, um, that the leaves are also affected and camellia petal blight only affects flowers. And that um, it seems like the browning in the photo is on the outside edges of the petals. Camellia petal blight typically starts from the center of part of the petals. 
Um, so I just want to point out that camellias typically grow best where they have taller trees or structures that protect them from direct sun and wind and getting hit with hard rain. Um, so I'm going to guess from the picture, it looks like this plant's pretty tall and it doesn't have much protection. So to address the problem, I would suggest if it's possible to prune the camellia down a little bit lower so that it's, it, it can be protected by a building, maybe it's outgrown the protection that it used to benefit from. And um, a great time to prune camellias is right, is shortly after the whole plant is finished dropping all of its, it's finished with all of its flowers, which is, you know, pretty soon, right about now in some parts of our county, um, that's a good time to, to be pruning camellias. Thank you, Betsy. Next slide. Question two is, I have a dwarf Meyer lemon tree that gets a sooty coating on the upper side of its leaves and all sorts of white and black mayhem on the underside of its leaves. What can I do short of scrubbing the, the leaf? I'd like to direct this one to Cindy Burkoff. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Thank Cindy. Um, sooty mold is a fungal disease that grows on surfaces uh, like leaves and the stems that are covered by honeydew. Uh, honeydew is a secretion from aphids, any sucking insect like aphids, ciliates, uh, leaf hoppers, uh, mealybugs, those kinds of things. Uh, the best way to control this is to control the insect that's creating the honeydew. Um, and also to watch for ants. Ants are particularly um, attracted to honeydew as a source of food, and they will actually protect whatever the insect is from the good bugs that would normally come and eat the aphids or whatever you have on your plant. So you need them to prune up the leaves so that the ants can't get into the tree um, or put something around the stem of the tree to keep them out of the tree. And then um, other than that, the only thing you can do is to um, use a heavy spray of water uh, to get it off of the tree, maybe a little soap and water. Um, I have a, a very large uh, dwarf uh, Meyer lemon and I had this two years ago. And now um, I noticed this year, um, cause I went out to check to see if it was gonna get more. The thing to look for is on the new the new leaves, the new stems around the flowers on the tree, look and see if you have any, any insects of any kind. Uh, often it's aphids, but it can be other things as well. Um, the, and <clears throat> well, the new leaves and flowers are uh, common, particularly this time of year or earlier in the spring or later in the year when it blooms again. Um, you need to make sure that you don't overwater this tree or over fertilize it because that'll send out new shoots, which again, attracts the insects that are gonna come and chew on the new leaves. So, but it doesn't hurt the plant. Um, it looks dirty, but um, mine is almost all washed off from just from the rain now off of the leaves. Um, so you can just let it go. It won't hurt anything uh, as far as the lemons or the tree itself. Hey, you know, hey, Cindy, this is a question. For, this is Jonathan, another panelist. Um, would, would the white and black on the underside of the leaves, uh, wouldn't some of that be aphids and, um, and, and washed off with water? And also, if, if this is an aphid thing, um, will the aphids tend to go away as the weather heats up? Well, they'll, they'll go away as the, the soft growth matures, so it, because they prefer the soft growth. It will also, they'll also go away if the good bugs come to your garden and eat the aphids. But if the ants are there, ants will actually protect those insects against the good bugs and uh, keep them on the tree because they like the honeydew too. I have um, just something to add. Um, I have some uh, bee boxes, um, native bee boxes on my wall out in front in my front yard. And I was having a problem with ants 
getting into the holes. So what I did was I put talcum powder around the out around the box because B, uh, ants will not pass over a talcum powder. I put it in the threshold of my doorways. It, it, I mean, if you don't want to use chemicals, it's a great way for keeping ants off of things. So that's just an added tip there. So oh, that's good to know. Say about this subject. Okay, let's move on. Um, the third question is, I recently planted an English laurel. I've noticed the leaves turning yellow and drying. Um, I will attempt to answer this question. Um, when we plant things in the spring, um, anytime you plant anything, it needs to have water. Um, it, you know, as it matures and roots into the ground, you can ease up on the water. But when it's newly planted, it needs water to establish. Plus, there's heavy winds right now. Like last night, for a while, the winds were pretty, really blowing. And that wind sucks the moisture out of the leaves and the leaves dehydrate and they turn brown, especially if the, um, if there is not water, if the roots do not have water. So when the leaves dehydrate, they go to the roots for moisture. And if it's not there, then the, the leaves will turn brown. So you wanna make sure that this plant is uh, uh, properly irrigated. And I don't know, um, Betsy wanted to know what kind of soil um, was being used. Um, and if you amended the soil before you put it in, Soil is really a, an important thing in the growth of any, any plant. So um, maybe you could turn off, uh, maybe um, Janet could turn you, your uh, mute off and maybe if you're in the audience, you could tell us a little bit about how you planted it. Maybe not in the audience. Is the person here who submitted the question? Um, I do. Uh, in the if you identify yourself in the chat box, we can come back to this, Janet, um, and give the person time to identify themselves, or just chat, type into the box uh, what kind of soil they used, if they amended the soil or other watering or whatever, and move on to the next question. Anyone else have anything to add to this question? Okay, the fourth question is, uh, this large oak tree has been surrounded by very bushy old azaleas, camellia, rhododendrons, and ivy with, sprink with sprinklers around for at least 25 years. It is, a concern, is it a concern to have too much water around the oak? The oak seems okay and healthy. Normally I would uh, make a ring around the tree by keeping the ivy away. And uh, I think Carolyn probably can answer this question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Cindy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a great question. It looked like in the picture, if we just maybe go back, just a slide, just this looking at the picture, we can all kind of see. So there's this really large oak tree. I'm guessing it's a coast live oak, but um, that, that's not so consequential what it is. But it looks like there's some ground cover over part of the area, and then some really pretty shrubs on one side of it. So. Yeah, that's what we're dealing with. Again, it looks like a coast live oak. So look at our answers here on the next page. Um, I think it's a really great question that you're asking because we've heard a lot about can you water, can you put plants under oaks? Can you water oaks? And there's sometimes some confusion about it. So I think the first thing to think about is just understanding how oaks grow in our area. You know, we have a Mediterranean climate. And so what that means is we get winter rains and we have dry summers unlike you know, the Midwest someplace where it actually rains in the summer, you know, where they do dry farming or something. So we have dry summers. So, they, so the optimal conditions for our native oaks is to, is to you know, simulate their, na their, native condi their natural conditions, which is not to get um, any irrigation or watering in the summer because it doesn't rain in the summer. But a lot of people want to also have camellias, azaleas, rhododendrons, really attractive um, ornamental shrubs in the same area. And those are plants that are 
plants that normally grow under story, under some tre under trees or under the canopy of a tree. And they normally want more water. They come from regions that get more water than we have here. So you really have a conflict, right? You've got a, a tree that doesn't uh, want water in the summer versus kind of a thirsty plant like a rhododendron and azaleas. Um, you know, those grow in a much wetter forest conditions than our native oaks. So what do you do? The good thing is this isn't a very established garden. So it's 25 years, it has sort of been this condition. So she has mature rhododendrons, azaleas and camellias. That mean mature meaning they, they are probably have a very well established root system. They've been treated the same way year over year. So they're sort of conditioned to coexisting together. And, and the oak tree as well is a mature, it looks a nice green, healthy oak tree. So, you know, our suggestions are that um, you are doing watering to focus the watering on the shrubs, you know, in the, in the dry seasons. The oak tree doesn't need or want the extra water in the summer, but particularly the rhododendrons and azaleas are, they like to be kept fairly moist. So make sure when you're watering, you're focusing in that direction toward those shrubs. Very well established camellias, and Betsy probably can chime in on this, they tend to do pretty well with less water as they're more mature, given that they're not directly in the sun and not windy and you know other conditions like that. But camellias can fare a little bit better with less water than a mature rhododendron or azalea. If you are gonna make changes, we recommend that they be slow and gradual. Um, so, you know, one of the concerns about watering with oaks is there's an oak root rot fungus called uh, armillaria, and it's, it's common in this area. There's a couple different armillaria fungus, and so it thrives in conditions of moisture and, and warmth, and that's why watering in the summer is problematic for the oaks because they are susceptible to getting this uh, root rot fungus. And while it's called oak root rot fungus, there's a lot of plants that can get this fungus, a lot of ornamentals, a lot of shrubs, a lot of fruit trees. So it's not only with oaks that get this fungus. The fungus doesn't do well in the winter where it's cooler months, but in the summer it can, it can um, really reproduce. So, I, so a few things what I would suggest. Um, you've also got ivy and and ivy also can take water or not, you know, if it's mature uh, population of ivy. My inclination would be to maybe take, remove the ivy, um, or it looks like it's going pretty close to the tree trunk. Try to take it further back from the, the center of the tree, maybe more out toward the edge of the canopy if you want to have ivy. There are some other uh, ground covers that you can put under oaks that really do well with, less wa with no water in the summer once they're established. And I'm gonna put a uh, link in the chat after my answer here. So you might wanna get rid of the ivy and maybe go to something that's gonna be a little bit less uh, water thirsty and, um, and then mulching around uh, the, underneath the canopy using either let the oak leaves stay down there or a light mulch I think will be helpful. Um, things that can stress the oak and make it more problematic would be any sort of compaction or um, any buildup of soil around the oak uh, base of the trunk. And it looks like you don't have that, so that's great. So keep that up. Um, and, and really the oaks would prefer to just not get the water in the summer. If we had a really hot period of weather, it's possible the oak might benefit from a little bit of watering or some watering, but it should dry out between watering. So. I think um, you're probably okay with your situation, but keep an eye on your oak. Look for any symptoms like um, um, if there's a dieback of shoots or you see cankers on the base of the trunk or anything that just doesn't look right about your oak tree. If, you know, a lot of our plants, sometimes you step back and you might not know what's wrong with it, but you know something's not right you know, that's good, uh, good to be seeing that and um, find somebody that is that can, you know, knows about plants and can maybe take a look at it. Also any mushrooms growing around the base, clusters of mushrooms is a sign of the, it could be this fungus or some other fungi, fungi that could be a problem. So it looks pretty healthy. It looks like you're doing everything pretty well. Um, it's established. So um, 
you just, just keep an eye on the water. I'm really glad that she raised the issue about being concerned about water under oaks because yeah, in general, we just don't want to water them in their uh, summer seasons. Any, any other thoughts from my co-panelists? I think you did a great job of explaining the whole thing. I think I noticed that Ruth, so Ruth is the one who submitted, someone named Ruth submitted this and there was a something in the chat about someone named Ruth wanting to speak. Yes, yes. I, hi, uh, let me see. I wanted to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Oh, good, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, helping me. The first question about my English Lolo with, yes. the, uh, with the leaf problem. And mm. uh, yeah, my answer to this, how was it uh, planted? It was planted actually in the winter time. It came in the, in the bulb, uh, in the burp, uh, with very clayey soil, basically, from Oregon or something. <laughs> And then our original soil actually is pretty good, in pretty good shape, fairy roots. Uh -huh. And uh, so they planted the whole thing, the clay. Actually, soil, is, soil was not amended. They put the huge 15 gallon, okay? Uh, huge clay ball into the existing soil without Saw amendment, and then winter. It was winter. There is some rain. Uh, in the first couple of months, they look very good, but now it, we notice a lot of uh, brown leaves. Ruth, okay. how, how often are you watering this plant? Uh, about once a week. Uh, after. Well, the, these last months or so when we don't have rain at all. Uh -huh. With the increased winds of spring, you might need to water it a little bit more. Okay. If you have clay soil though, your water probably is uh, not draining real well. Is, is that the case that you find? Yeah, it's very interesting. I test the soil moisture around the, the root ball, around the root area and with the same plant, there are some spot that's very dry and some spot very wet. I feel that one part of the plant was uh, over water and the other plant was very dry. You know, it's very uneven. We have sprinkler uh, system and then we also hang water a little bit to make it up because the sprinkler were not able to cover much, uh, cover it evenly, but it's still with same plant and uh, very wet on the on one side and uh, very dry at other area. Do you have new okay. growth on, do you have new growth on the plant? Yes, there's new growth and, and the new growth is green. Yeah, pretty much. Well, I, I do think that the problem, I don't know, maybe the panel has another thought. I think dehydration in those leaves is what's happening. And it could be from the wind. Um, Ruth, that I, yeah, Cindy, I have a suggestion. Ruth, um, one thing that helps yeah. a lot with a newly planted, is it a large shrub or is it more like a tree? Uh, very, almost like a tree, it's 15 gallons. Okay, so yeah. one thing that really helps with a newly planted, either woody shrub or tree like that, is to make sure that there is what we call a well around the base of the tree. No, normally what you would aim for is when you plant it, um, you the goal is to plant it so that the soil level in the container is not lower than the soil level that you're planting it into. Sometimes people make the mistake of planting it too deep and too low. You don't want to do that. But you want the, basically wherever the soil level, you want the, the place where the trunk transitions to roots, that little curve, right? The first roots, you want them to be fairly close to the surface, not buried way deep under the surface. But then what you want to do is a, like in a, make a ring, around the edge of the planted area, about the same circumference as the 15 gallon container, a little ring of 
mulch or light loose soil so that when you can put water into that ring and let it soak down into the root, the whole root ball. Um, because what you want to be sure of is that the entire root ball is mm -hmm. evenly moist. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like maybe what's happening is part of the root ball is getting some water, but the whole original root ball is not getting evenly watered. And you want the whole original root ball, all, all everything that was inside that 15 gallon container to get a steady, even amount of water about once a week, a good deep watering. So the whole thing gets wet and then has a chance to dry out a little bit. And then about a week later, another good deep soak. So that whole root ball gets wet evenly again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that help, uh, answered your question, Ruth. Um, we're gonna have to move on to the next question. Um, do we have another question or, or um, yes. Um, this is a response to, okay. Um, I thought, did we have a, a question come in about zucchini, um, Janet, that we could discuss before we go to the chat? One of our attendees has a question. So I'm gonna unmute Kathy or ask Kathy to yeah, unmute. We have a question about uh, onions from Kathy. Okay, what's the question? I, I'm getting conflicting information on how to grow and harvest onions. Last year, almost all of mine got soft during storage, trying to store them. And then I read here where if you trim the tops, if you do the spooning around, and, and I'm wondering, did I leave them? Did I let them cure long enough? I'm just, I'm not sure what I did wrong. Huh. Let's, uh, Jonathan, can you answer that question? I know you're a vegetable guy. I am not an onion guy at, you're at not all. An onion guy. Um, it, you know, in, in the past, I've tried to dry other things and, and not done it successfully. So, you know, maybe she's not getting enough air circulation. Um, Cindy, do you want to say something? You're looking like you do. Um, I haven't grown onions either. Uh, but I think it's important to dry them out and to keep them separated because they still have a lot of moisture in the stalk um, after you pull them up. Uh, also, it might be a question of how cool the place is where she stores them. Uh, generally, when you're storing vegetables over the winter, you want a really cool, dry, not moist place so that they don't get soft. You know, I dry herbs um, and um, when I dry the herbs, I take them off the stalk, um, the stem, because I, I believe that there's moisture in the stems that prevents the uh, leaves from drying. And I want to dry them as quickly as possible because I want to preserve the flavor of the um, herb. And I do use a wire basket. Um, so the air, there's a lot of air circulation. And I don't uh, have it in uh, bright light. I keep it um, in a warm kind of darkish place. And as soon as they're dry, I put them in airtight container. Um, so I don't know, maybe that helps. Um, maybe it'll work with onions too. I've dried bay leaves and other things, but onions have a lot of moisture in them. So mm -hmm. um, maybe a dehydrator would be better for onions than um, you know, trying to dry them in a basket or something. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Carolyn. Yeah, a few things. <clears throat> so, you know, there's different types of onions, right? We've got the yellow, the red, and the white. So they have, the yellow onions tend to uh, hold the longest to stay dry, then the red ones and the white ones actually have the shortest uh, holding uh, period just in general. So that's one consideration, what variety you have. And then sometimes you see ones that are long day versus short day varieties. You might see that on the seeds or get information about the variety. So the long day varieties also tend to be better holders than the short day varieties. Um, and then it comes also to, yeah, from, the, from when you start, when you're ready to harvest. So one of the things they say is to let your plant dry out completely in the soil. When you think it's dried out, 
let it stay in the ground for another week or so. Then take it out and cure it, as others have said, where you maybe a week or so where it's in a uh, dry, it's in a sh shady place with air circulation where it can really dry out. So, you know, so in the garden, you obviously stopped watering the plant, you let it dry. And then when you thought it was dry in the ground, you let it dry even longer, another week, take it out and then start curing it. And then one, one of the things that's, and then store it in a, a cool, dry spot. Um, and then it's recommended eat the biggest ones first. The actually, the bigger the, um, the onion, it's the, those are those are more likely to not stay, you know, and that kind of makes sense because you, you know to dry it all the way to the core. So the little ones are actually going to cure and dry better. So use the big ones first. Look for those varieties that um, that, that hold better. Again, it's in the sequence: yellow are the best holders, then red, and then white the least. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Okay. I you. think it did. Thank you. You're okay. welcome. I'm I'm just going to add one more short thing, which is. I've never grown onions, I didn't know anything about them, but I have a trick I will teach you when you're looking for information that's writ written out. If you type in your search field, onions space UC, then many of like University of California, many of the first things you'll get um, from searching will be related to advice from master gardeners. And I just did that and the Santa Clara County master gardeners do seem to have a handout about onions. So if you want something that's written down that you can get back to, if you do that search onion space you see, and then look for something that's called onion handout from the Santa Clara County Master Gardeners, that also may be really helpful. Although they don't have all that great information about yellow, white, and red, that's cool. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Um, and yes, um, and I will just mention that um, Master Gardeners are sponsored by UC Davis. And as I'm sure you all know, UC Davis is a huge agricultural school and um, have lots and lots of information. So if you ever have a question, you can go to um, UC Davis or, um, and ask your your question and you might get an answer um, or to our help desk, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, okay, do we have any other chat questions? Yes, we do, Carol. We ha uh, Carol has a question about her irises. Her what? Her irises. Irises, Carol? okay. Carol. Oh, hi. Hi, Carol. Hi, uh, Master Gardener. <laughs> <laughs> too many names for me to remember. That's okay. You, okay. What's your question, oh, Carol? Oh, okay. The rhizomes of my irises have ants. Are the ants beneficial or harmful? And I live on the coast, uh, Half Moon Bay, El Granada area. I would say ants are never helpful. <laughs> okay. That's what I would say. Um, there's a reason the ants are there. Are the ants in, uh, do they have a nest near the bulbs? Um, or are they actually on the, I mean. They're crawling, they they're crawling around and I don't know what an ant nest would look like. I, I mean, if anyone else wants to jump in, but I would guess that there's an ant nest around your, where your bulbs are planted. And the ants are, of course, getting all over your bulbs. Um, and um, and th why is this troubling to you? They're not eating your bulbs. Uh, I don't think so, um, but they're creepy. You know, they, yeah. if I go in there to uh, a trim, something you know they crawl and they and you get full of ants i happen that happens to me all the time i disturb an ant nest and i'm covered in ants yeah um, um yes carol carolyn i was just gonna say uh not sure if do you have the if you have the um like a 
bearded irises or the the native um, like d the Doug iris or Pacific Coast high, uh, Highway hybrid irises. But you know, in general, irises are really hardy plants. Mm -hmm. they're, they're super low maintenance plant and they're very versatile. So you know, if you're not seeing any damage to the plants, um, have you had flowers blooms from your plants? Yes, I have, and something uh, has. Uh, nipped away, eaten away at some of the flowers, but not all of them. It's not ants. I, my yeah, dog was ants. It's so I, okay. think, I think in general, they're pretty hardy. Now there might be some, some the nectar, you know, in um, irises can be sweet and it's possible the ants might, pers you know, go after it um, when they're in bloom. But, you know, the, they're just such a hardy plant. I, you know, your question is, are the ants a problem? to the plant. I would doubt it if you're getting uh, nice green leaves, you're getting uh, flowers seasonally, then they're not, they're, they're just living there. It's a, probably a nice little uh, protected spot for them in the, in the base of the rhizomes and they're probably just hanging out there. But irises in general are really hardy plants. Some of the other plants that we talked about earlier with the tender new growth coming out um, and the ants protecting some of the insects that are damaging plants, that's sort of a different situation, but I think you're, you're, I think you're probably fine. Okay, you. thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Kathy, do we have any other questions in the chat box? Uh, not yet. So if you have questions, please add them to the chat box. And in the meantime, help questions. Okay, um, the Master Gardeners have a helpline and um, you can call in and um, Kathy, can you put that number in our chat box? Um, the, the number for our helpline. And so if you have, oh, we'll go to this question in just a second. So if you have a quest, gardening question, you can help call the helpline. If there's no answer, leave a message and someone will get back to you and they'll be happy to answer your question and give you references. So uh, question five here is, uh, I live on the North Quadrant of San Francisco. I got a small cutting a few months ago uh, from a plant in the Presidio. My cutting, uh, my cutting has rooted and has produced beautiful purple blooms. Can you identify, help me identify it? Next slide, please. Does uh, anyone want to talk about the um, valerian? I, I can talk about it a little bit. Okay, so, good. Um, this plant is okay. called, it, the, it has a couple different common names, Jupiter's beard or red valerian. It's not related to other things that are called valerian. So don't mix that up. Um, it, the botanical name is Centranthus ruber. It is, um, it, it, grows easily and spreads itself easily by seeds. And so some people consider it a weed just because it kind of plants itself. Most people like the way the flowers look. Um, a few people do not like the way the flowers smell. So I happen to think it's really pretty and kind of fun and it just fills in empty spaces in a nice unexpected way. Um, but some people feel like if a plant fills in some, a place unexpectedly, then it's a weed and they don't like it. So different I was on the freeway responses. yesterday and I, there it was growing on the side of the road. Yeah. Uh, the flower is pretty. If you have a place that's difficult to grow things, this might be a good plant to put there. Um, yeah. it, and also, it does, it does it, have a few different colors. There's, there's a white one and there are a couple different shades of pink and darker. And they, are, they are for sale in the nursery. Yeah. So and um, Half Moon Bay, they're very pretty. Cindy, you had something to add? Yeah, I was just going to say it comes in several colors and it does. Um, I have it in my uh, native garden and it grows very well and it's in an area that doesn't get a lot of water. And it's one of the first plot flowers that comes up in the spring. So I'm happy to have it for my bees. Yes, anything that grows on the freeway doesn't require a lot of water. So <laughs> next nope. question, please. Question six, I've inherited the, um, the care of a beautiful fig tree that bears green figs. It's probably 30 years plus 30 years 
and it's growing in the ground. I live in the San Francisco Marina and the tree gets morning direct sunlight and afternoon low sun. I have not fertilized it since I inherited in 2016. I have no idea how to, what, how to best care for it. Jonathan, are you a, a fig guy? I am. Um, I, I think there were some others on the panel who, who had a little better fig information. Yeah, I mean, so I always thought that figs liked a little warmer weather, um, but I, I guess if it's doing okay in the marina, that's great. Um, I find that figs really don't need a lot of care. Um, they're, they're, they're quite hardy trees. I find the same thing. Um, and they come up all over the place. Um, so that too, yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they, and they, they grow just, they grow in a very unstructured way. They get um, rangy very quickly. But if this is an old fig and you're happy with the shape and everything, then great. I, um, in, the, in the winter, I prune mine back to the nubs um, uh, so that it doesn't get too large. And the tree doesn't really seem to, to mind that um, so that I can keep it in control because figs can get quite large. <coughs> um, and then you can't pick the figs. So uh, probably uh, fertilizing it once a year wouldn't hurt. Um, when the trees storm, when I wouldn't fertilize when the trees storm, and I would fertilize when the tree is starting to grow. Um, and see how it goes. Yeah, my, my biggest problem with figs is keeping the squirrels out of them. Yeah, the birds <laughs> and the squirrels and the rats love. Yeah, them. so I I end up um, netting them. Get five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my problem too. That's the biggest problem I have. And mine is growing in kind of a weird place and it doesn't get a huge amount of water either. So hope that helps. Can we have the next question? <clears throat> I have, I have, a, I've had a lemon tree for years now and finally got a backyard last year and decided to plant it in the ground. It has actually produced a ton of fruit and flowers for its size but does not seem to produce any new leaves. I'm concerned the tree will be stunted in its growth or if, or if there is something I should do to improve the situation. It gets a lot of sun. <coughs> um, yeah, the tree is probably in shock. That's, does anyone wanna take this question? No, okay. Um, transplanting can be, can put a tree into shock um, and your tree needs leaves um, to take in energy so that the roots can produce, um, you know, take up nutrition. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see, you can consider covering your, um, your plant, your tree with shade cloth until the plant establishes itself. So in other words, it's getting too much sun, excuse me. And the shade cloth would shade it a little. When things are trying to establish and root, sometimes they, they can't do that and take all that, um, the, um, the light from the sun, the rays from the sun, and because that produces a lot of energy and the plant is not established enough to deal with that much energy. Um, so it could have a zinc or an iron deficiency. So apply a foliar application, um, that might help. And there's some links here that um, um, might help you also. Um, if you take note of those and make sure you give the plant some water, but don't overwater it. Um, lemons, uh, citrus in general, don't like to have their feet drowned, their roots sitting in water. Anyone have anything to, to add? And I, again, like Betsy said, when you planted the plant, you needed to, you know, leave a big enough hole so the roots could spread out and um, that the root ball can 
get water and her idea of putting the mulch around, I think is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you planted it, but hopefully, hopefully mm -hmm. that'll work. Can we go back to the slide for a second? Sure, let's go back to the slide. It looks kind of sad. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I mean, I'm not a lemon expert, but chances are if it was in, it was in a container with potting soil, the soil it was in was nicer than the soil it went into yes, because a lot of our native soil not. here is not very good. So the plant very well could, could be in shock. Mm -hmm. And look at how dry this, the, the ground looks. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you, you it, know, amending the soil over time, giving it a little more water right now, mm -hmm. all the things you mentioned. Yeah, Carolyn. Yeah, I agree with everything we're saying. One thing is they, I mean, they do like water and I see it looks like a lot of weeds and other things around the base of it. So you might wanna clear the area of competing plants um, that weeds do that. And like you say, put down a layer of mulch. You know, we're going into our warm season right now. And so it's had a shock, it got transplanted and now we're also going into warmer mm. weather and uh, longer days of longer hours of sunshine. So I think Cindy's advice of um, have let, so it, it looks like it's, in, I mean, I don't know if it's in full sun all day. I don't know what its light is, but you know, the afternoon sun is certainly more intense normally than the morning sun. So you may want to, if it's getting a lot of hours of sunlight, I would definitely make sure it gets some covering during the day because um, it's going to take several months for it to kind of recover and get into its new spot. I think typical fertilizing is sort of from March till September, October. I think a, a very gentle organic, you know, fertilizer um, just to kind of help get it some nutrients and some compost around it to get some organic materials in the soil and then a layer of mulch to help protect the soil, I, I think would go a long way, but it's gonna take probably a few months be before you can see it turn around. I actually had a Meyer lemon in a container for the longest time, like the container it came in, you know, so that's like for years. And I finally freed it and put it in a bigger container, but it took a while, just, it's still a container, but it's finally in the container, the right size for the plant. But it, it took quite a few months for it to really kind of recover. And I had to sort of baby it along um, until you started seeing some new growth. And you could tell, it, okay, it's starting, to, it's starting to recover from the transplant situation. Or, um, so I think it's got a lot of hope because it's such a good plant. But yeah, the, the mulching, the weeding, the shade cover. And I'll yep. just quickly mention the mulch is going to be really valuable for holding some of the moisture in the soil, but don't mulch right at the base, right at the trunk of the tree. You, you want that the right where the trunk goes into the soil, you want that space to breathe. So hold the mulch away from the trunk by a few inches. And you know, um, it's true with all plants, the, the, the potting soil that they come in I, I don't know if you've ever had this happen. I'm sure you have, everybody probably has. You have this nice potting soil and the roots are happy in there. And um, you take it out and you take this plant out and you put it in your soil. And those roots are gonna try to stay in that potting soil. They are not gonna wanna go into your you know, garden soil. And so you start getting the, you know, the wrapping around in the ground and you could pull the plant out and it's still a little blob because it's never wanted to enter your uh, garden soil. So sometimes, um, especially when you're doing a big tree or something, washing the roots off um, so that the garden soil is no longer there, the potting soil is no longer there um, is very helpful, so. And also yeah. I think as a, a rule of thumb, if you're planting a shrub or a tree, that you ought to plant it uh, in the same depth as it was in the pot, but it should be in twice the width. So it should be a much bigger hole than the pot it came in. And I think that always yeah. helps a lot too. And that's hard to do sometimes, you know, you think, oh, it'll go in this hole. So, <laughs> but it is important. Okay, next question. Yes, so Carol has a question about her avocado tree. Yes, Carol. And what is the question, Carol? Sorry, 
unmute. No okay. Uh, okay, I have a 15 year old avocado tree growing in the ground and it grew from a seed. It does not bear fruit. Uh, does it need to be grafted in order to bear fruit? And is it too late at this point in its <coughs> life to do so? Thank you. How old is your tree, Carol? I'd say it's about 15 years old. 15 years is a long enough period of time for it to fruit, if it's going to fruit. Um, I, I'm not an expert on avocados, but I know that it needs, there's two types of avocados and you need to have whatever your avocado is, the other kind of avocado needs to be somewhere in the area. Oh, okay. Um, so that they can, it can fertilize, um, so that they can, I'm not an expert at this, so it can fertilize your tree. Yeah. If there's no tree around, then you will get no fruit. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone have any more information about avocados? Um, um, how about gr oh. grafting? Excuse me. Uh, grafting of uh, if it does not have another tree around, uh, can it be grafted? Yes, but you need to graft the right thing. So uh, just a graft won't help. You have to have the opposite of what it is. So yes, you could certainly try that. I mean. I don't think it would hurt. Um, okay. Okay. And Mrs. Shelton, you were. Oh, yes. I'm just, I'm just going to, again, tell everybody this cool trick. If you search avocado space, you see, you're likely to get some really helpful information. The, the explanation of the the A type of tree versus the B type of tree and, and the pollination needs is pretty complicated to explain and it's easier if you read it. But the, the two things that come to my mind are, first of all, since you started it from a seed, um, uh, that might not be the right type of avocado. That might be a type of avocado that's delicious to eat and buy from the market, but not the right type of avocado to successfully fruit in our area. Okay. Um, also, you do need to have, if it's an A tree, there needs to be a B tree or it's better. It's more, you'll have more success if there's a B tree in this, at least in this, within a few houses of you, okay. um, which is kind of complicated. Um, so, but it might prove to be a very lovely tree that's just a nice tree that doesn't necessarily give you fruit yes um so it doesn't mean that it's a total loss it just might not be reasonable to expect it to give you usable amounts of fruit oh okay. betsy's okay. right that growing from a seed is not the ideal way to grow an avocado tree yeah. but um, it's 15 years old it's ready to fruit if it's going to fruit okay. um, it's, it's a great way to make a friend it's a great way to have a tree that's a friend it's just not a great way to grow a tree that produces a lot of avocados. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it is a lovely tree and I enjoy looking at it. And, and if it didn't bear fruit, I'd be okay with that too. You know, Carol, you can use the leaves from the avocado in cooking. Um, that's something you might want to research. Um, really? Mexican cuisine, they use avocado leaves all the time in their cooking. Oh, wow. I'm not an expert at it, but I know that they use them. So. <laughs> Thank you, for, you can use your tree. Thank you for that information. Appreciate it. Okay, let's move okay. on. Okay. Yes. So Billy has a question about his hydrangea. Ooh, hydrangea. Billy. Are you there, Billy? Oh, we can't hear you, Billy. Could you turn your volume up? Kathy, do you know the question? Maybe you could relate it to us. So, this question that is, he just planted hydrangea in the backyard. He's been watering it every day, but the plant looks dry, leaves look dry. He says, what should he do? 
He has planted new hydrangeas and he's watering, did you say two or three times a week? He said every day, the new hydrangeas. I think he says every day. I think an important thing to know would be to know where it's planted. Yes, it's uh, hydrangeas cannot take a lot of sun. It sounds so, like it's taking too much sun. Yeah, I, it, it needs to have morning sun and afternoon shade. Sure. And it'll be much happier. Uh, even a lot of water isn't going to solve it if you have too much sun. Again, the leaves are getting dehydrated for too much sun. It's a, um, it's a large leafed plant and it doesn't need that much uh, energy from the sun to, for the energy that the plant requires. So- um, You mentioned that the leaf tips are brown, if that helps. It's getting, probably getting burnt. Is it getting, is it, mm -hmm. does it have brown spots um, where, the, where the leaves turn? He just said the leaf tips are brown. And, and try and upload a picture. The plant is he is he giving the plant a lot of fertilizer? That he did not say. Again, he's only planted it a week ago. A week ago. Uh huh. And he's already got brown edges. Brown leaves looks dry. He might I be in shock take, too. I might take that plant back to the nursery where he got it if it's <laughs> old and it's already failing. Right. Um, it's pretty it's discouraging. Hard to kill a plant in a week. Usually they hold up for a month or so. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd think but if it's in the bright sunlight that could do, that could easily do it in a couple of days mm -hmm. yeah but brown tips shouldn't if it's if it's in the if it's in the bright sunlight it should burn it shouldn't de it shouldn't get brown edges which which leads me to believe of dehydration or over fertilization so did she fertilize it before she put it in the ground he didn't or, say sorry, sorry billy but uh, yeah, you know, maybe go back <laughs> to the place you bought it and maybe see if you can get another one. It's possible. So, um, but so you, Naomi, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you follow the instructions of morning sun, after, morning sun, afternoon shade? That's really important. And uh, hydrangeas like water. So, you know, even when it's new, it needs more water. But once it's established, you know, once a week is plenty. So, okay. Uh, I hope, good luck. Okay. Naomi has a question about root bound potted plants. Naomi, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some like geraniums and uh, gardenias and stuff that's been in the same pot for many, many years. And so they need to be transplanted because they're not doing well. And when I took it out of the, took the uh, plant out, like so root bound it's like a cement chunk um so can i like tear some of those off would that stimulate new growth would it hurt it i mean there's no way water can go through it there's no way new soil can can get to it it's a solid mass of roots jonathan do you want to take that no no okay um that's it i can try to help um uh First of all, with geraniums, geraniums are pretty sturdy and Carolyn may know more about this also. Geraniums are pretty sturdy. So um, with geraniums, you can definitely, I wouldn't, I would cut the roots. I would use like pruning shears or a, a soil knife so that you're, you can cut the roots um, and make the root ball a little bit smaller. Um, and then you can also wash the roots as Cindy, I think was the one who mentioned, you might just to loosen them up a little bit and then plant it into a, either a bigger pot with fresh potting soil so that it has some space to grow into. Or if you wanna plant it in the same pot, start with clean it all out, start with fresh potting soil and then cut the root ball down smaller so that you have at least an, an inch and a half or two inches of space at the bottom and around the sides to add fresh soil to it. Um, and with the geranium also, you can prune the, the top part back so yeah. that it's not, when, when you've done all this work to the roots, you're, it, you're not trying, it, the root, the smaller root ball is not trying to support the whole big plant. It can support a smaller plant and then the plant is encouraged to put some new fresh growth out. Um, and that generally will work for pretty much any, any kind of plant that's been in a pot for a long time. 
Okay. Well, the gardenia is more of a solid mass. I, so do you know anything about pruning a gardenia? Like it didn't even get much new growth. It, the poor um, thing is. The gardenia is going to be a little trickier than the geraniums because it, it, it really wants to be in the ground more than in a pot for a long time. Okay. Um, so you might, but you should still be able to prune the roots down a little bit and then repot it replant it with some fresh soil at the bottom and some fresh soil around the outsides. But I would um, maybe prune the top part back just maybe so that you've got two thirds of the original plant size. Right, prune back one third, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Okay, all right, thank you. I could add a couple things. Um, yeah, that pruning back is a really good tip, I think, on these transplanting kind of stressed out plants. It, it, and typically it's a, it's a good idea to do um, for shrubs to do a transplant when it's going into its dormant season and we're not we're not at that point that would be more something you do in the fall late fall so you can certainly do it but keep in mind it's not the optimal time to do it so you may want to have extra precautions like when we talked about um, with the lemon tree where it you know you may want to control how much sun and light it gets as we're getting into the hotter weather it may dry out sooner um so yeah keep that in mind i mean you get the fix to do it because you haven't done it you know all these years i have the same issue i've got some root bound plants and you finally say today's the day i'm going to do it but really plants do better uh those kind of things to do it in the when they're in their dormant season it can vary from plant to plant but i think in both of these varieties they would be going into the fall and I think geraniums are certainly easier to deal with than, um, they're, they're pretty forgiving, I think. Gardenias, I think, are a little bit fussier. Um, and then, you know, keep in mind what kind of soil conditions they like. I know gardenias like a fairly acidic soil. I'm not sure what, gar what um, geraniums. Geraniums, geraniums, the other G word. Um, I, I, think that, I think they're probably more tolerant of other things, but I know I, you know, it's funny, I see, I see gardenias in the neighborhood. I gave up trying to grow gardenias. I just don't think I have enough sun or talent for it, but I, I, see I have a fairly good sized one and it, it does not get a lot of sun. I, I think what gardenias really like is heat. They don't, you know, if it's a warm area, they don't necessarily need direct sun beating down on them, yeah. but they don't like to be cold, so. Right. Um, yeah, because I have a beautiful one, but it's taken maybe 20 years to get it to this stage, um, you know, where it blooms beautifully. So I think patience is one thing with gardenias. You have to kind of baby them along. They're not real fast growers either. So. Do we have another question, Kathy? Yes, we do. And I'm going to give this to the question because Heidi is driving. And this is the most fun, exciting question we've had all day. I can't imagine a more exciting question. She is having a backyard wedding mid-June and she wants to know what is flowering then that she can buy now to put in pots. Isn't that fun? Well, I would say, Heidi, in June, um, I would do annuals. Uh, if you want a splash of color, um, there are some perennials that will be blooming um in june um, um i don't know what does everyone else think i i think if you want a real splash of color i would buy annuals um and, and i would uh, depending on how much room you have and they actually come in different sizes i think cosmos would be a good um, yes, cosmos. um cosmos will grow fast they're very colorful uh they come in white pink magenta um, you can also get them in yellow if you want to, but um, they come in some that grow three feet or so tall. They also come in short ones that are a foot high. Um, that would be something that you could plant right now and it would look lovely by June. Marigolds maybe too, um, for a border plant or- Marigolds, right. Um, also- but I'd like to clarify, does she want to plant them into pots or does into she pots. Want to plant them into She the mentioned pots, although- no. So you want to be sure you interesting choose, too. So you want to be sure you choose plants that will be happy growing in pots. And I don't know what size pots you're planning to use, but that's a really valuable question. When you go to the nursery, 
be sure to read the tags or ask the person at the nursery, if I plant this in a pot now, is it going to be happy still in the pot by mid-June? Because many things, you might plant them now and by mid-June, they'll be exhausted if they're in a pot. So I'd be a little bit careful with that. I'd, want, I'd make sure that, it, that you're choosing plants that that will be happy being in a container of the size of whatever the pot is that you that you plan to be using. I got married in August and where I got married had a big fountain and it was empty. There was no water running in it. And so I filled it with plants. And what I put in it was ferns. I put um, hydrangeas all in pots and I put a couple of fuchsias and um, I can't remember what else, but to this day, I still have the hydrangeas in my garden and I still have the ferns hanging in a tree in my garden. And so it was very uh, nice to be able to keep the plants. So hydrangeas might be a good, potted hydrangeas um, might be a good thing to do and you can keep some for your garden. Uh, ferns are really nice. Uh, they're nice and lacy and frilly and um, I wish you good luck <laughs> having a wedding in your garden. That's a... And so much depends on the climate. Yes. We need to know the climate and the exposure. You know, where is the garden? And of course, that's all helpful too. But um, yeah, lots of color. I think <laughs> it's going to be fun. But yeah. I love the idea of keeping the planet going, Cindy. It's just a great idea to keep yeah. that part of the heritage and part well, of the memories. Lot to me, so. Not just in pictures, but have it right there in the garden. Yep. So do we have another question, Kathy? I don't see anything more in the chat box. If anybody has more uh, questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat box for us. Well, I would like to, um, oh, there's one. Um, a year ago, about a year ago, I started noticing real damage in my garden at the ground level. New growth of many plants, chewed holes, in the soil burrowing under the fences, etc. I've never had destruction like this in the past. Whole plants have been destroyed. At the same time, my neighbor started keeping chickens in a wire coop. I assume it's rats attracted to the chickens feed and or their manure and were put on a few, we've put out a few traps, but haven't caught any, haven't caught any. What more can we do? Is anyone a varmin uh, expert? It would be interesting to know if there was um, dirt on the outside of the hole or if, and if there was soil on the outside of the hole, how it was arranged to try to identify what it might be. <clears throat> well, I guess, um, you know, one clue as to if it's rats or something else is, is it happening at nighttime or daytime? So if it's happening at nighttime, it's likely um, to be rats. Um, although I suppose it could be raccoons um, as well, another nighttime critter. Rats, the typical approach is trapping. If your traps aren't working, um, the trap, rats don't like light and they don't like open space. So when they're moving around, they like to be um, next to a, a fence or, or, or something like that. So, you know, like I have uh, raised beds and they like to run right next to uh, the edge of the bed. And so um, if you do have rat traps out there, make sure they're, they're put in, in um, appropriate locations. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, if, it, if it's gophers, you're, that's going to be a different issue because gophers eat the roots and, and kill the whole plant. So that's, that's pretty obvious to see versus uh, rats, mice, and ground squirrels. Yes, because gophers... Um, well, just they'll literally pull the plant through the ground and eat it, the whole thing. Um, where um, rats will, you know, kind of gnaw on it. But I've, I've not had rats bother my plants. You know, things, if there's fruit or vegetables on my plants, yes. But the plant itself, they don't usually, at least at my house, they don't bother. 
I, so. I agree with that. They, they've eaten my vegetables, but not like the leaves and stuff like that. I did have a, I, I do have a pot of strawberries and I had it next to a wall, little wall and they were eating all my strawberries. The rats were eating my strawberries. So I moved the pot out far enough so that the rats couldn't jump to the pot and they, and, and now I have strawberries. So it was a simple fix. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but very frustrating when you're trying to grow fruit or vegetables and somebody's eating it other than you. So. Um, I will just say rats will eat the tops off plants off the leaves. They will also eat the green leaves. The first year that we had our tomato um, and pepper sale, the very first year when I was in charge of it, we had a, a large quantity of our not beautiful sprouting young tomato plants sitting outside of the greenhouse and um, a large number of them got just eaten off by rats. So they do eat, they will sometimes eat the green green leaves and green growth. Yeah. Okay. Cindy, I was just gonna add a couple of things. Um, you know, Jonathan mentioned, you know, the solution would be trapping, whether it's um, gophers or uh, rats or mice, and and I think that's something we we if you if you want to get rid of them that we recommend that versus um, you putting poison out. Um, you know, a lot of people when they hear of rats, they just oh just you know call the exterminator and you know poison and everything. And and just just a reminder to people that if you put poison out, what can often happen is the animal that you, you know, your target may you know eat the consume the poison, but then a predator is going to eat that, that, that sick rat or that sick mouse. It could be your neighbor's dog, your cat. It could be a raptor, a crow. So, you know, there's consequences if we poison the animal. So the better solution is, is to, you know, trap them if that's what you want to do. And, and also when you do trap them, you, you can't, you basically have to kill them. You can't, you, you can't trap them and then take them up to a park or take them to an open space or take them down the street, you, you're not allowed to do that either. So um, just wanted to remind people about, you know, mm -hmm. extermination. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have another question? I don't see any more questions in the chat yet. Um, okay. So if you have any more helpline questions or any uh, more follow-up questions, let us know. You know, um, I would just like our vegetable people to talk about, um, this is this time of year is uh, tomato growing time. Everybody wants to grow a tomato, but tomatoes have a particular science about them um, and how to plant them. So maybe we could talk about a little bit that about that a little bit so that people are a little more successful. Um, tomatoes are native to um, Mexico and Central America. So what they like is warm, wet springs and hot, dry summers. Um, so if you think about it from the tomato standpoint, it, most of the time um, when you see tomatoes at the nursery, it's nowhere near warm enough for those tomatoes. Um, they need to have a nighttime temperature of above 50 degrees every night. Um, I usually think about Mother's Day as being the time to plant tomatoes in my area where it's warm enough um, to, to um, sustain them. But I also always notice that about a month after I plant my tomatoes, um, and I usually grow about 25 plants a year, um, is when the seeds that are in the soil actually germinate. So that tells me that if you're gonna plant from seed, you need to wait another whole month until the soil gets warm enough. But if it's above 50 degrees at night, then you can plant tomatoes out in your garden. Um, they don't particularly like it when it's, it goes from hot to cold, hot to cold. Um, they're just gonna sit there and sulk when it's cold. So you really don't get any advantage of planting tomatoes too soon. I think another thing to remember is that tomatoes should always be planted deep 
way, way deep. So if you get a tomato plant, a start from the nursery, you ought to t um, pinch off the bottom leaves on the plant and then plant it right up to its chinny chin chin of the leaves down in the ground. Uh, tomatoes are one of the kinds of plants that actually will develop roots. The little hairs that you see on the uh, stem of the plant will all develop into roots for the plant. So by planting it deeper, you get more roots faster for your plant and you'll have a, a healthier, bigger tomato plant. Um, Cindy, Cindy um, just one thing. Um, Cindy is the tomato expert for, for all you folks there. So this is actually a question for Cindy. Um, last, last year, I, I heard a suggestion about um, pinching off the early flowers on a tomato, um, actually removing them, um, and that that lets the plant um, get a little bigger and stronger um, before it actually starts to set fruit. And particularly at, at this time of year where it's still not that warm, um, you know, not clear that you're going to get fruit out of those flowers anyhow. So um, what do you think about that pinching off the early flowers? I, I wouldn't pinch them off because they'll fall off by themselves. In order for um, the tomato plant to germinate, for those flowers to actually develop into tomatoes, it has to be somewhere between 60 and 70 degrees, even at night for them to germinate. So if they don't, they'll just drop off by themselves in a few days. Also, there's a difference between determinate and indeterminate plants. And therefore I wouldn't pinch them off because I wouldn't want to uh, get in the way <laughs> of whatever the natural plant wants to do. Um, the other thing I would do though, is as the plant starts growing taller and taller, I pinch off all the leaves on the bottom 18 inches of the plant um, because a lot of the diseases that tomatoes get are act, actually reflected from the soil. So your water splashes on the soil, there's a fungus or some kind of um, something there that they don't like and it splashes onto the leaves and then that's when you start to see all of the wilts and other things that you have with them with the tomato plant. So I just um, pinch off the bottom of 12 to 18 inches worth of leaves. And I also mulch around them really good so that I don't have that splashing from the soil. I have planted my tomatoes <coughs> in the same spot for 20 years. And actually they, they say you shouldn't plant tomatoes in the same place every year because you may have these fungal diseases in the soil. Um, I don't have the, the hottest, warmest place in my garden is those four beds. So that's where the tomatoes go every year. And I've learned to pinch off the leaves, do lots of mulching, things like that, that keep down the um, other diseases. Carolyn, do you have something to add? Uh, no, I think that, I th well, that's okay. all good advice. I, I, you know, that is an issue for a lot of people that don't, that only have a limited amount of sun. I've got a good friend and she, and that she, the only thing she grows is tomatoes every year in her same raised bed year over year. And uh, uh, something I just learned this year, um, and there's a paper, a scientific paper written somewhere about it, but I learned um, that growing broccoli after your tomato season, that that will help uh, manage the, some of the pathogens that can build up from the tomato plant. The tomato plants in the nightshade family, like potatoes, eggplant, and, and that family in particular can get a buildup of pathogens over time. And growing broccoli um, is a way to help manage that soil, especially if you're just growing in the same place. Also cover crops probably help. Um, yeah, and I, I've, as my broccoli growing hasn't always been the best. So now this year I'm going to grow it in the fall, not for food necessarily, but just kind of like as a part of a cover crop so I can grow tomatoes in the same, warm, the one warm spot that I've got in my yard. Uh, that's, that's good to know. I'll have to try that. Yeah, yeah. 
I don't we, know. We, we, there was a question in, in the chat window. Um, what are your thoughts on culling off beefsteak tomatoes purposely to get fewer but larger tomatoes? Mm, that's, that's really a perf personal preference, I think. What do you think, Cindy? I, yes, I think you can do that. And if you, if you um, live somewhere where you don't have a lot of hot sun, you might want to do that so that you get a couple of nice, big, juicy tomatoes, um, but not as many. It's also recommended late in the season. You know, some like a beefsteak can be a 90 day tomato. So if it's September, you know, and you've got these small green tomatoes on your plant, they're just not, they're not going to make it uh, probably to that 90 day big juicy tomato in December. So especially as you get toward the end of the season, it's a good time to evaluate your plants your tomato plants and just look at the things that maybe aren't going to make it um, mm -hmm. to, to full maturity and, and take those off to give the rest of the plant and the ones that are on there the chance to, that are a little bit further along to give them that chance to make it to the end of the season. And actually what you can do in, in September or October is to pinch out the tops of the plants or cut off the top couple of leaves of the plants. That forces all the growth into everything below there, and that will help those last green tomatoes uh, ripen up. Of course, there's always green fried tomatoes too. So. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I think um, we're done with tomatoes. Unless, is there anything else um, that, Kathy, then in the chat box or anything else to talk about? No, Naomi just said, thank you for the good ideas. It was Naomi's question about uh -huh. steak tomatoes and she thanked you. So thank you for, uh, whoops, chat box questions. Um, our next cl uh, plant clinic will be August 1st. I don't know if it'll be a Zoom or at the Arboretum. So stay tuned. <laughs> um, we'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, for supporting our presentations, the San Mateo Arboretum Society. Um, and today's presentation was presented by UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo, San Francisco County, and photographs by community garden gardeners asking and questions uh, and by UC Master Gardeners. Um, remember that we have a helpline that you can call if you have any gardening questions or we didn't answer your question fully today. I think we did a pretty good job of answering questions, but um, you can go to our um, website and either call or um, call or email. Here we go. Um, and we'll be happy to help you. And please, um, if you have a few extra dollars, we could sure use uh, funding uh, for our program. We reach out to um, schools, uh, communities, um, and we try to promote um, gardening, um, vegetable growing, native plant growing, habitat growing to our fellow citizens. So we could sure use your help if you so desire. So um, <laughs> I'm like confusing you, Kathy, back and forth. So here is our email and you can call and our website and um, I hope you enjoyed today. I hope we got everybody's questions. And um, thank you very much. And thanks to our panelists and to all our helpers. Happy gardening. Happy 